Welcome to the Glass Lab podcast, where we talk all things product development. It's our goal every month to introduce you to the people, ideas, and development tools that are shaping the hardware products we all use every day. So welcome back to the Glass Labs podcast. I'm Grant Chapman, CEO here at Glassboard. And on the Glassboard side, I've got Tamara Mullins, our Director of Operations on her first Glass Lab podcast. Um, but I'm also equally excited to introduce our guest today. So we have Dr. Patsy Bracken, the Director of Engineering Design at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. And we got Chase Strother, who's one of our externs over the summer and in her program at Rose Holman. Thank you guys for coming. We're happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. No, it's been super fun. So ever since you guys visited the office, we've been looking forward to this podcast to kind of share about what you guys are working on because it so closely matches what we look for in engineers, right? Most traditional engineers are very numbers driven, very process driven, and not as user driven. And that's what I think your program really highlights that you need these broad set of skills to talk about what users need to make products. Because at the end of the day, even engineers that build manufacturing, manufacturing equipment or other things, they have users. They're the people on the line. They're the product engineers. And viewing products through that lens really helps what I've seen come out of Chase, at least, uh, take a good look at that. And even if he doesn't know injection molding yet, which we're working on or other things, he tackles the problem the same way that we want all of everyone at Glassport to tackle that problem is user first, who are we solving for and how do we solve that problem and kind of divvy it up. But other than that, I've talked a bunch and I'd love um, for you guys to introduce yourselves very quick. We'll start with you. Dr. Dr. Bracken. Okay, so I'm Dr. Bracken, and I've been at Rose Holman since 1995. And engineering design is relatively new. We were we formed about five years ago, and our president at the time challenged a group of us and said, um, "I think we should be doing something new in education. We need we need to be looking at what the future needs." So there were two professors. Dr. Don Richards and Dr. Bill Weiner, and they worked for a year like doing research and looking around, and then they put together a group of people to come up with ideas, and I got to be in that group, and I got to prototype the design, uh, one, the, the design approach, and what we ended up doing was actually smashing a bunch of approaches together. Awesome. Awesome. And then Chase, you're in this program now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a rising junior um, in the program, been in it for two years now, and I'm on co-op with you guys, obviously. So our program is definitely structured differently. So, you know, we go through the first two years of schooling as normal, and then our junior year, we take two six-month uh, co-op periods. So we'll skip fall and spring quarter, uh, and then come back for winter quarter for classes. But we're working in those two quarters that we take off. Yep. No, and I think that's so important to get that, like, industry experience. And Tamara, you've been really helping me lead up our, you know, talent pipeline. What do we do for internships? How do we onboard and hire? So I know you've been dealing with this program and kind of listening to how his experience has been different than our other externs. Right. So the great thing about Chase's experience and being in a co-op is that we're not trying to smash an entire semesters of experience and as much drinking from the fire hose with short we call them short, quick putts. Yep. Um, we can actually put Chase on larger projects or something that's more long term in order to get him more experience, but also really, you know, slot him in on a program where he's going to have a, a long term impact. So the the ramp up is not as intense as uh, your normal summer internship, but I think the value that these students who are going through rows get are it, it's much more valuable because it is more like real life it's not like at the end of the day here here are the cookies that you made and you get to take them home he's thinking about what what are we going to be doing in a month what are we going to be doing in two months yeah no it really is a whole lot more you know school teaches you to live semester to semester and that's all you have to survive you know, every, what, 12 weeks or, or so, you get a clean slate. Even if you're doing poorly in a class or you don't like your professor, you just mm -hmm. got to grit your teeth for 12 weeks. And in the real world, 12 weeks is like a blink of an eye. So it's really helpful to have you engaged on these programs longer so you can see why we grind through the hard parts or why the easy parts were easy and how the hard parts are coming down the pipeline. So it'll be really fun to, like, experience that with you. Um, but I think one of the questions I've got, like, most fervently in mind is you said this was an amalgamation of different approaches and different ideas. Can you tell us how and why those came to be? Again, I think this is a super interesting backstory because what you're doing is such a broad skill set that you're trying to impart on these students. So when, when the group met together for the first summer, 
um, we, we did some introductory work about what they said that future students would need, what they said that industry would need. And then they split us up into four groups to go off and make little prototypes. And I know my group was the prototype, the group was supposed to prototype a design approach. And there was another group that was supposed to uh, prototype putting together many disciplines. And then there was another group that was supposed to prototype um, being free, I think, like uh, getting more uh, external experiences. And then I forget what the fourth group was supposed to do. I can't remember. But I know the one about external experiences. Their idea was that they, that students would have a whole year to just do like a walkabout. Mm -hmm. So they would just go off and learn whatever they wanted to learn. And then as we began putting it all together, we said, okay, maybe let's not do a walkabout, but what if we think about internships yeah. or co-ops or um, working for a not-for-profit? Something where you're using some phase of the design process, as long as you're learning about some phase of the design process, and that gives you complete freedom because almost anything can be put into the design process. As long as you're learning about the design process, then that's what we want. And students are also required to take an online class. And originally the idea is that the online class was gonna match perfectly with what they were doing. And that got difficult, didn't it? Yes, and it doesn't quite work out. So what we have done is try to come up with like some general online classes. The one that Chase is taking next quarter that I'm so excited for him to take is creative design. Mm -hmm. And we talk about a lot of different creativity techniques. And I'm going to tell him, you've got to try some of these techniques at work. Yeah. And I have some students who are very shy and don't want to do that, but I know Chase will do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm very excited for that class. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll blend really well with what the industrial design side of what we do between Ben and Ramon in, in our office, trying to get that creative side of how does it look, how does it feel, how does this make the user excited or useful, or how does it bring up those utility. Mm -hmm. That are going to make you use creativity in a really hard way, which will give you a technical problem, and then you're going to have to go get creative. And those are really the most impressive portions of creativity. I want to tell you something. You told me that you wanted our students to be better able to sketch. Yeah. So I went to our art teacher and said, hey, I talked to somebody in industry, and they want our students to be better able to sketch like sketch out their ideas on a sheet of paper quickly and I have no idea how to do it. So she's going to come day two and start teaching little sketching ideas and everybody's going to get a sketchbook. I think it has 50 pages. And by the end of the quarter, the you only requirement, it has to be full. Yeah. All they have to do is show me that that sketchbook is full. And she said, because you get better by practice. So you had an effect on our curriculum that we're incorporating like in about a month. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. fantastic. And I'm sorry you don't get to do it because I know oh, you yeah. would have loved it, right? I'm so sad now. <laughs> Luckily, uh, Ramon and I see Ramon and Chase, they, they're they doing sketching sessions together. I want to say weekly. Yep. And I'll see these sketches. I think there's one of a teapot hung up on our refrigerator at work right now. So it's, you know, like your kid brings home their artwork from school and we're putting his sketches up on the refrigerator. So uh, the, the ovals are getting much better. I'm, I, I can see the improvement, and I'm not an artist. I'm glad you can see it. Did, yeah. you, did you rope Elena into that, too? Because I saw her in one of the invites. Yeah, so Elena, <laughs> she just came into the kitchen to see what I was up to because, you know, we're all best friends, all of us interns. Uh, and she was just like, oh, I want to be a part of this. So now she's on the invite. Yep, and now. she was the one who hung up the picture on the on the Of course. <laughs> I, I, I didn't doubt who hung the picture up. Yeah, yeah. That is, that is her MO. But that's super amazing to hear that your curricula is able to respond so quickly to my more or less on the spot feedback um, that may or may not be warranted, but I'm really glad you trusted me on it because it is such an important part that it's a skill I actually lack. I am, you know, you've probably never seen me write and the two times you've probably been embarrassed to try and read it, that I don't have good handwriting, I don't have good sketching ability and I would have never become an engineer had it not been for computer aided design. I'd be stuck being an attorney on a typewriter, and if it was before typewriters, I'd be in the field somewhere, you know, being a farmer pull, pulling a plow through the mud, because uh, my hand-eye coordination doesn't let me do it. But the members on our team that are really good at this and are, are really talented at visually showing their ideas quickly, both internally when we're trying to, you know, debate over a technical challenge, as well as explain that to clients of here's option A, option B, option C, 
and being able to spend so little time, you can explore and show more ideas really helps speed up that creativity and that design process. So I'd love to hear if you've got any like leaders, what are some of those, you know, hidden tricks for the creativity in design that you were talking about? Okay, so one of the first things is don't judge your idea. Just be willing to say anything. And so we sometimes do, well, we do on-the-spot designs, but we have one where we got a set of cards from Northwestern uh, from their uh, master's program in uh, creativity and innovation, and you pull out a customer, and the one that we pull out a lot is grumpy old men, <laughs> and what do they need? And so maybe grumpy old men need a way, a better way to... Get um, the kids off their lawn. Okay, get the kids <laughs> off their lawn. And the constraint might be that it's, um, it, it has to work on the moon. And so then you have to generate ideas for that and make a little prototype in 20 minutes and explain it. And it, practice, practice, practice. Practice doing crazy things. And then you're beginning to free up. So I won't chase the talk. Tell, tell us about, like, in terms of what do you think has helped your creativity so far? Yeah, um, I think on-the-spot on designs are absolutely, like, something that I love doing. I, like, whenever I see that on our schedule for the week, I'm always super excited. Just because it's, it's always something silly. It's never something real. So mm -hmm. you can, like, go as far as you want with it. And I love, like, going around the class and hearing everybody's ideas because then it just... I feel like it frees everybody up to know that we all work so closely together because we're such a small major that nobody like laughs at each other's ideas or this person has really good ideas that might be realistic and this person's kind of like more creative than realistic. So that for me, that like helps me put together who I want on my team for the next project and then also be um, more open to like sharing my ideas on those like real projects that we do in class. So I would say that's a big proponent of it. And one of the projects that the interns have been working on at Glassboard this summer has been revamping our prototype shelf. So products that we've created, they just sort of sad, sat on this shelf. And when people would come in, we would talk about them. But we tasked the interns with finding a creative way to display them. And Chase, can you kind of talk through that through that project a little bit of of how it started, the feedback you got, and where where you where you all went with it. Yeah, so um, it you know just started as uh, like here's an intern project, you know go ahead and go ahead and do it. Um, and so I think it was originally just going to be me, but I kind of tagged Matthew and Elena into it um, because Matthew's our hardware intern, so I wanted him to you know help with like lighting and things like that if we needed it. And then Elena's marketing, obviously, so you know that's like my my creative little little person on the team. Um, but it so we originally wanted to just kind of redo the stands that they stood on um, and we thought you know that's not that's not good enough like glass board we need something you know glass light some transparency some transparency in our product display cases so we um, bought these acrylic cases um, and we did exploded views of each of the products oh I love exploded views yeah. they're so cool no, and they, it, it's, they it was super hard to do because it's not in CAD where you can't just drag the part up and it freezes in space. You right. guys actually had like to suspend them in space and yep. make it invisible or magical the way they're being hung. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I've been designing a lot of those like invisible like shelf holders or you know like triangle braces or whatever, and we'll we'll glue them to the to the back of the display cases. And then Matthew route, uh, routed um, like LED strips through all of them, so they're all lit up and they do different like light sequences and stuff, and they're turning out really well. No, they they look great, and I think the the best part was we threw a curveball at them because the moment I saw the first one, I was like, I can't pick this up to show somebody. This isn't useful because we're a hardware company. Like this is Adam. We have to be able to, like when someone comes in, I hand them one of the prototypes, like touch and feel this thing. And you guys instantly came up like, ooh, got it. There's one in the case that's lit up and exploded you. We have to make a place for each one of these that's fully assembled. That is the one you hand around and kind of demo. And that was so cool to watch them go, got it. And they disappeared and scurried away. I'm like, I don't know if I hurt their feelings or if I gave them direction. And the next day there were like two stands like, ah, they got direction. This is fantastic. And I think that's the part that school is so hard to teach is that okay with being wrong all the time. Because mm -hmm. Purdue does it through just beating you down. Purdue's grades are horrible. You get a 36% in the class, like points at a points possible, and somehow that's like a B minus. But through that, you learn to just accept failure all the time and realize it's going to be okay as long as you really do try and understand what you're doing and apply yourself. Whereas I think you guys are doing much more of a better job of like exercises that show that like crazy and weird ideas end up, you know, skipping their way through the pond to the right idea. And that's such an important part of engineering. You and I were just talking about that on the way in here today. 
that engineering isn't about being right. You're only right the last time you do it. And iterations never happen one time. And then you, you, may, be, you may be good the last time you do it, and then it turns out it may even get better. Right. So you never have a guarantee that you have the very best thing. And that drives some people crazy. And there's no right answer. You don't know if you're the best. There is no way to check. And sometimes it's better to have shipped it 10% as good ago because it costs too much money to engineer and perfect after that. And that's another hard lesson that a lot of the, when we're interviewing, again, we don't hire people that get 4.0s. Like it's actually part of our like rejection criteria. Like if you have a straight, perfect report card, you aren't going to be happy at Glassboard because we don't get it right every time there is there's no way in the creative world that you and I live in right. that it is right it's you gotta be okay with varying degrees of good and good enough in iteration that oh we were almost good enough here and here we were you know had deficiencies where we had to like rework this test or prototype and mm-hmm. I mean you and I have gone back and forth talking about how to design a like a study with it with users right because they're the biggest variable of all and every time I run a study it exactly matches population risk variances i'm like yep this checks out this many people you know did it different and and when you look at populations the rubrics match up and one thing that uh has really delighted me about the the interns coming out of rose is that you do put them into um like cross-disciplinary groups um and then when they come to glassboard Chase was bringing in Matthew. He was bringing in Elena. He was bringing in Logan. It wasn't just his project. He took the initiative on his own to make it collaborative with the entire team. Can you talk a little bit, Dr. Bracken, about kind of, we're seeing the results of it, but your thought process when you were saying, you know, we're going to get these groups together for these projects. So I think from my standpoint, so right after I graduated, I went to work in industry, and I was in industry for five and a half years, and everything you do is team-based. There's no, at least in my experience, so there may be some places where there's that lone genius that works in their garage and comes up with something well, but typically that's not what's done, and as things get more complicated technically, then you have to you have to have a team. So you want to give a project that's big enough that it needs more than one person to work on. And we do let them do some individual projects so they can have some fun and have their own little thing. Most of our projects throughout the studios, though, are all team projects, and they're all big enough that one person can't do them. So is that would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't have gotten done any of the projects that I worked on in main studio classes without the teams that I got put with. So I also want to talk about the unexpected. So in their very first studio, they make a toy for kids with disabilities. And we work with a local not-for-profit called Reach Services. And they have a lending library of toys that parents, teachers, or therapists can check out. And so typically the students come up with great ideas, and then they take them out to let the kids try them out. And that's when sometimes weird things happen. So did anything weird happen when you let your... Kids, tell us about your project and what happened. Yeah, yeah. So our project was, um, it was called Shapes Cubed. So we had a big uh, rectangular prism, uh, or or I should say, like a block, basically. A rectangle. A rectangle. That was three-dimensional, a block. (laughs) And inside of it was a rectangular prism with a sphere inside of that. Um, So they all nested together, kind of like Russian nesting dolls, and then it had like a carrying handle, and you could take it places. And so the idea was for kids with um, Down syndrome, they, you know, like bigger, chunkier things because they have fine motor issues. And then we also color-coded each block so that they could memorize the shape based on the color because that's kind of how their minds work, and it's easier for them to memorize stuff when it's by color. So that was our original idea, and we followed it through to the end. Um, But when we were making it, we brought it to reach services and the kids were trying to stack the shapes inside of each other. So like the, the rectangular pyramid, they were trying to stack on the, the cube mm-hmm. when they put everything back together once they'd taken it all out. So we didn't account for that and they didn't fit inside the faces that we had impressed on each of the, the different shapes. So we went back to the drawing board, fixed it, put them, put them back in and then they loved it. They, they asked for another prototype too, so they have two of them now. Um, yeah, that was my favorite project by far. No, that's awesome. And that that unknown is, you know, what it is, it's always the users that blow up the use cases. Like us engineers think we've got it perfect and we give it to an end user and 
it is completely something different. I mean, it's why McDonald's coffee cups say caution hot and why chainsaws in the manual in the back says don't cut your hair with this because someone has tried once. Yep. Um, that was my very first lesson at Purdue. I didn't know about the don't cut your hair. Yep. Oh, my yep. goodness. That was never <laughs> underestimate what your client or your, your end customers will do. So no, that's such an important part of like what we do is put yourself in the shoes of the end user. You really got to get out there sometimes and, and way out in the distance when you're trying to put those disparate users together and ask the questions of how will this be used? Why is it important? What are the driving factors? How do you provide value, right? How do we pitch this product? How do we help our clients raise funding and convince people that this is important? Because it's, you know, engineering and product development is so much softer than numbers and cents or 3D printing. Anytime I get packaging that I can't open in the real world, I just think like, they did not go through user testing for this package. So thanks, Glassboard. <laughs> yep, exactly. But no, I, I, I'd love to know, Chase, what, what from your experience at Rose is the most different than the real world? Because we talked about all the, all the wonderful things. And I want to see, you know, what's, the, what's so different about the real world that you're experiencing now versus what you did in class, like from the projects or, or whatnot? Um, I would say the timelines. So <laughs> like in our studio classes, we have 10 weeks to make a project. Sometimes it's a couple weeks less than that because, you know, we're getting kicked off and things like that. Um, but I, I came here and then we're like, oh, we're in discovery phase for three months. We're in active development for 12 to 18 months. Like it's just it takes a lot longer than I than I expected. And that was kind of like a kind of a relief. And it also like kicked me in the teeth because I was like, oh, I got to like race to get everything done. Um, and like it doesn't have to be perfect because it needs to be done fast. But now I'm like, oh wait, we have we have time. We can perfect it. We can take our take our time, not stress out about it. So yeah, and that mixes with. But when we go cut tooling, you cut tooling, and when it gets out there, you know, software developers have it easy. That's called a software update. We have what we call recalls. Right. And you know the the price of being what I'll call it, there's between like not being perfect and being wrong. And the price of being wrong in hardware is incredibly expensive for mostly, again, for people like companies, our clients, partners that are building on products. Like if that product wasn't tested to where it needs to be and we get it out there and hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of them start breaking, I mean, that's not just the inventory, it's the shipping cost to pull the parts back. It's the shipping cost to provide new parts, the new parts that have to get made, the new tooling. It's, you know, you quickly add it up. And you're like, ooh, yeah, we should have spent an extra three months validating that product and that part. And that's the one thing that Purdue actually did a pretty poor job on in my education was validation. We did a lot of design work, or not even design, but like checking, like do the math, calculate the stress in the beam, make sure it's right, go to this lab, measure the voltage here. But we didn't do a good job of open-ended validation. Like, hey, you have a user that's gonna use this product, design a test that will prove it works 10,000 times. And, and that's really, really tough. It is. So, I was lucky um, to get to go through the Design for Six Sigma training at Cummins. They offered to let somebody come down and do it. I'm, I'll do it. And uh, one of their accelerated life testing, that's really complicated. And I will say, Chase doesn't know anything about that. I don't even know if I've ever even mis mentioned the, the words to them. But that, it, you know... You have to pick and choose what it is you're going to do. But I would say we are probably weak on validation, although he does know it needs to be tested, yes. right? And um, more than just one time. So what's hilarious to me with first-year students, they want to try it one time, and if it works, they're like, oh, we're done. Green checkbox. The Excel chart goes green in the Gantt chart. We color the, the cell green, and we hit save, and we move on. That, I, I completely understand that. We see that all the time. And uh, one of the professors, uh, Dr. McCormack, um, he had the students read the ASTM standard for testing toys. Mm -hmm. And one of the famous tests is a drop test. And there have been many shocks over what happens in that drop test. Very much. <laughs> and Impulse is a hell of a thing, right? It really and, is. and very it's, difficult to design for. It yeah. is, because you're, you're dropping, like, it's not moving that fast. It's really dropped it from four or five feet. But man, that concrete floor hit, it slows it down real fast. Yeah. And it's also how are you dropping it? You know, in one of our previous podcasts, we talked about user testing and durability. And it's like this user is gonna have it on a nightstand. So we're gonna be this far off the ground. This is how close to the ledge it's gonna be. This is, you know, how they would bump it off. The, this is the cat that pushes it off yeah, the edge this of the, is the table. Cat <laughs> that pushes it off the edge of the table. So it's like it's gonna bat it hard and it's gonna skitter across the floor. And those are all those things you have to think about. Like a three year old flinging that toy is a very different trajectory of a uh, engineering design student going 
like this and dropping it very gently so it passes the test. Right. Yeah. Uh, see Volkswagen engineers in Dieselgate. Designed <laughs> to pass the test is not the same as designed for the intended application. Yeah. Right? And that, that happens all the time. It's like telling engineers that the test is too early is almost bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because uh, they'll design for tests, not for application. Right. Because they want a passing grade. This goes back to that, like, that need of affirmation, need of passing grade in a lot of students because school emphasizes that so much. And the reality is school's not there because whether you got an A in history doesn't mean you really learned the lessons you're supposed to learn to carry forward or, or the hunger of learning how to learn. What we want to see are the kids that are like, oh, I kind of went to class. But I mostly spent time in the Formula SEE garage or the solar car garage or insert XYZ Okay, project. don't say that. You, so in NGD, you have to come to studio. It's, it's true. Yeah. 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 If you miss studio, you're, you're done for. <laughs> yeah, but that's a lab class, right? Mm -hmm. See, I went to all my labs. Okay. Well, ours is, ours is an everyday lab class. It's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday from 8 to noon, right? Mm -hmm. That's a commitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a commitment. Because, again, in, in Purdue, we, I had, what, I think, hour and a half classes at the lab courses like nothing was longer than that yeah no ours are ours are a lot of time spent together which is why the NGD major is so close like I just texted everybody who's on co-op yesterday and I was like checking in like how's everybody doing and I got um, all my pings back so how is everybody doing everybody's doing really well yeah everybody's happy um there are a couple who are like I'm ready to come back you know like my internship's kind of burned out, but I'm, I'm ready to stay here. I'm ready to keep going. So, <laughs> yeah. So are those, are, are the other members of your, of your team on group chat, are they scattered throughout the country or most of them local? Can you kind of talk a little bit about some of the other places yeah. that this co-op group is, is located? Yeah. So we have, um, one who's in Minnesota, one who's in Michigan, um, a couple who went, um, to the like Northeast region. I don't know if anybody went out to the West coast this year. Um, I don't think so. I love there are so few of them. That, that's it. Yeah. Right? Like at Purdue, in just mechanical engineering, it was a four-figure number in my graduating class. Like, I just, there's no way I could have known everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's 16 of us on co-op. I think so. Yeah. So there's probably more because of the first-year students, right. some of them. And But you guys, yeah, your, yeah. your class. Your graduating the class is like... 15 to 20 people, maybe. Yeah, I think my, my like, rising junior class is 16 people at this point. We started with 20, and I think we're we're at 16 at this point. Your attrition rate's better than Purdue then, too. <laughs> it's way better. Purdue's is way worse. So I'm not sure at this point anybody's attrition rate is representative because COVID was really hard. Mm -hmm. And COVID was particularly hard on us because we really need that hands-on. In-person, yeah. In-person type things. You're echoing how we, we work at the office. You know, everyone was moving to that hybrid schedule, that fully remote schedule, and at Glassboard, we couldn't do it. We were in the middle of the bad parts of COVID, and I was driving 3D prints around like a UPS driver every morning to all my engineers. But the moment we could go back to work safely, we did. And in the office, we hire locally, and we hire in person because you have to touch it. I mean, you see it every day that yeah. Devin's got a circuit board that Ethan's writing software for, that Hunter's making the, the enclosure it goes into, and someone has to pretend to be the user that's not involved with the project and come in playing dumb and hitting all the buttons in the wrong order to make sure the software accounts for that. They get so mad at me. I know. <laughs> you and I are both known as the people that break prototypes because we use them like real users do, which yeah. is poorly. <laughs> holding holding uh, devices in my hand and they just shake their heads because my hands are so small and narrow and I go, this hurts, make it better. Yeah. <laughs> and just hand it back. And, and good then, for you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. And then, you know, also shipping. You know, we've yeah. got to ship things out. We've got to get things back in the office. Um, you know, we we do a lot of uh, logistics oh, um, yeah. at, at Glassboard and it's great to be a part of it because you hear other other teams talk about, you know, being lonely or, you know, they only see their coworkers once a month and we're we're a very tight knit group, much like your co op. I think that's mm -hmm. why you're thriving so well. Yeah. Is because the energy you had with your studio crew is the same energy that you're seeing at Glassboard. You seem happy. Absolutely, yeah. I, when I was looking for co-ops, I was like, I don't want to go to a big company right out the gate because I don't want to be, you know, shoved in my little corner to do this project that's not going to matter for whatever's going to happen. Like in, in your cubicle to do your intern project for the summer. Right. No, exactly. And I'm very, very happy with how this has turned out because I, I need like a team atmosphere to work and to be productive. Because, I mean, just having Matthew and Elena, like, to hang out with and do work next to every day, even though if it's not directly involved with them, like, if we're not working on our display case project, I, I just work better. So, 
Well, we'll see how you survive here this fall yeah. <laughs> when, when the weather starts to turn and, and all the other extras have to go back to school. But Elaine will still be right. in the city at least. Yeah. And yeah. Matthew's only, you know, he's right up the road at Purdue. And I'm sure we're not going to be able to keep him away. No, I think not. he's going to keep coming back mm -hmm. uh, any chance he can get. Now, I have to ask you this on camera. Are you the one who put the ring doorbell onto the refrigerator? So every time it opened, we got the ding dong. Was so you? we didn't realize that you had found that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> It was definitely a group idea, and then Matthew implemented it because Elena and I kind of like make him implement our ideas. So yeah, it was a good prank. It got me for a solid few hours before I finally figured out where it was, and then I ripped it off the door. So you guys got me pretty good. Good, I'm glad. I warn you not to prank Drew. He's uh, the retribution is usually swift and fierce. Oh gosh. <laughs> You picked a good target. I'd say, and you, you won't be punished. You will be pranked. That's the trick. It's not it's not bad retribution, but whatever you dish out, be prepared to eat back. I feel like that's worse. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So I think the the other fun part about the program that you guys have put together, that you're in, that you've put together at Rose Holman, is the amount of hands-on that we just talked about. The reason it's important for them to be in class is because you're making them build stuff without an instruction booklet. It's not Legos, right? Oh, from what I've seen. Absolutely, it's not. And they come up with ideas that, you know, I would never have conceived of. You know, like their cube, their thing for uh, children who have Down syndrome. That, that would have never occurred to me at all. And they have all kinds of really cool ideas that... I'm sitting there going, wow, that's a really cool idea. I wonder how we're going to do it. Now, we have, so uh, Dr. McCormack is one of the professors, and he's good at design for manufacturing, and he's also great with mechatronics, like uh, putting together, like, the hardware for the electronics. He's really good at that. And then we have an amazing technician, Brad Nofke, who worked at Lilly, uh, I think, for 30 years, and I met him when I was on sabbatical at Lilly, and then after he retired at a very young age, um, I saw him one day and we said, oh, let's go to lunch. And I told him about this program that we we're getting ready to start. And we did a prototype for six weeks in the summer. And so I said, oh, please come help us with this prototype because, I mean, it's really hard to find somebody who'll work for you for just six weeks, mm -hmm. right? So he came and helped us and he's like, wow, that was a lot of fun. And so then when we started the program, he came as our technician, so we are we are thrilled. And he, at Lilly, he did a lot of designing of a lot of the fixturings mm -hmm. that they needed um, when they were going to be doing clinical trials. And so he he knows just all kinds of random things that are useful when you're actually trying to make something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm TA for our like class, our department as a whole, and so I work with Brad a lot because I work in the prototyping lab, and he's just absolutely knowledgeable like I've learned so much just about like designing 3d prints which Brad doesn't know how to run a 3d printer but he can tell you how you need to design your part to print correctly on there and just like I mean just that one aspect I've learned so much from him but like just that one aspect has impacted my like my projects and my work and my work here just so much like he's absolutely amazing and so I heard something yesterday that to me was totally revolutionary and you probably already know this, but um, in creative design, Nathan Atkinson was saying, well, you know, we were looking at an, the, an origami video, and Nathan says that that's really helpful in 3D printing. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. What do you mean? And he says, well, there are a lot of 3D prints that you can design flat, mm -hmm. go very fast, and then you just fold them up. I'm like, okay, that's weird. That's really weird. Show me. And he did. And I was like, wow. So he sent me in chat just some examples of doing that. I had never considered that. So now I think that I'm going to go tell Brad about that. But have you seen that before? I've seen it. I haven't been able to do it yet, but it looks pretty cool. Well, And thinking in that origami method, like the step fold method, no one teaches sheet metal good enough in college. But I discovered it my senior year, and that was part of my senior design, was building these battery packs for our Formula SAE car. And I did bent sheet metal aluminum and you start learning these tricks you can do that, you know, fold it back on itself to make a lip here or a ridge. And you have to start thinking not in 3D, but in like stepped three, like 3D, but time based. Like, okay, first I have to make it like this and then I can bend that all over the way like this. But how do I get the tool in there? You know, how do I get the, the press brake in or how do I get fold this up to fit it into the, the equipment I have to bend the metal? And then you realize you can print tooling, 3D print tooling that'll bend your sheet metal for you. Then all bets are off. Then it's full creativity. So 
helpful hint that like you can absolutely 3D print tooling to bend sheet metal. That's cool. We've also done light duty uh, deep draw forming. So like, you know, like a coffee pod, like a Nespresso pod, flat sheet of aluminum, 3D printed jig, put it in the hydraulic press and you'll do long draw poles in light aluminum. So super fun to learn, super easy. So again, this kind of blends into our 3D printing mythology that in class we don't usually 3D print the end part. We spend most of our 3D printers time printing tooling to make it out of production materials. Oh, wow. And, and the ability to use that um, that really tough form labs. Oh yeah, the rigid 10K material. Rigid 10K yeah. material to print the molds that you then take back for injection molding, which is, you know, your hot glue gun on steroids mm -hmm. to be able to print or to be, you print the form and then you get that piece out of it and then you can touch it and feel it. And in the see. end resin, like in the end thermoplastic, you're going to make it within the tens of thousands. And, and see if it feels the way it's supposed to feel. If I can hold it in my hand, if it... If Does it, it stretch the way? Does the snap fit click the way you want it to click, right? Because exactly. you don't have to inject the whole part. You just have to inject that snap hinge, right? The, that living hinge. So you injection mold that part on the small scale, glue it into a 3D print. Now the whole thing works as if it was production. Oh, I love how you think. Oh, yeah. You, you only prototype the parts you have to hard. Everything else is hit the, you hit the easy button and you 3D print it. But when you need to feel, how does that snap fit feel? What is that living hinge? Is that too thick? Is that too thin? Is that going to fatigue? If I open and close this 20 times, does it start to have a little white witness marks and going to crack eventually? You can't tell that in 3D printing materials because it's 3D printing. You have layer right. lines. You have all these problems. But if you can make a small injection molding tool and just do your hinges, then you glue that into the big 3D print. And you can all of a sudden do your fatigue testing on the bench for dollars instead of thousands of dollars. So helpful hint for all of you guys in the lab at, at Rose Holman. Use your 3D printers to print tooling, not just to print your parts in it opens up this huge world and learn when you're at school because no other place are you paying the money you're paying to go to Rose Holman or Purdue that gives you the keys to the kingdom of a big lab full of all the equipment you could have ever dreamed of with people that are paid to help you do silly and stupid things. And when it breaks, it's not your problem. It's not your livelihood. It's learning. So use those times and equipments to do that. I mean, you're already using that in your TA and you're, you're diving headfirst into it. But we see so many students that try and, you know, give us a resume and I'm like, awesome, what did you do outside of class? And I just get blank stare. I'm like, you weren't blowing things up or breaking things or like having silly stories? Like that's what college is about. Like how many buildings did you burn down while right. you were in school? <laughs> and they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, this is a serious question. Yeah. We, we're looking for an integer value greater than zero. We want yeah. one building caught on fire. You weren't you weren't playing with enough danger okay. at school. No, we don't want one building caught on fire. We, not burnt down, just caught on fire. As long okay. as they use the fire extinguishers properly, it means their safety training was good. It's happened. It's happened twice in the lab. See, you good, so. yeah, great. <laughs> but like we said, it's all it's all about doing it safely. No students were hurt, and only a table got sandwiched, right? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah. So, sure. Uh, I won't ask about that. <laughs> I'll ask about that later on. So, yeah. interesting. But, okay. But no, I think that's the the cool part that your program is naturally enabling, right? So I think at, at Purdue when I was there, and then for most of our other engineers, mm -hmm. we had to go find things and like put ourselves out there and for the introverts it's really hard um, but your program forces them whether they're extroverted or introverted into this collaborative team-based environment full of toys literally and figuratively with your toy design class um, to help hone these skills in engineering in the method that emulates the real world as best as you guys can so I think that was why we wanted to have you on the podcast and kind of like talk about that Chase anything we're missing that's like either been really shocking here at Glassboard to learn compared to your school or what you think Rose did great to prep you for this or what advice you'd give a future student trying to get into what I'll call like real product design rather than just, you know, engineering where you're specializing. Right. Yeah. I would say that um, something that Rose definitely did awesome um, to prepare me for like this internship, especially was um, not only like giving me the technical skills in like the multidisciplinary major that we are and like not just mechanical, not just electrical, not just CS, um, but also like the soft skills that we get working with our teams. I came into Rose and I was not super extroverted. I was kind of quieter. Um, I'm actually shocked and not being facetious. That's surprising. <laughs> yeah, well, Dr. Bracken can attest to it. I was I was quiet freshman year, um, but I definitely came out of my shell last year, I would say. Um, and my entrepreneurship concentration, which we can focus on um, in our major, like it's a built-in concentration, has definitely helped with, the, helped with that, along with like the team interactions, the client interactions, um, just finding where I fit in has definitely helped me come alive. 
And so Chase really was quiet his freshman year. And You're both lying. I'm convinced <laughs> of it. No. And so he started going over and printing stuff in the, the lab. And so we started off in the beginning letting any student go over and print something in the lab that wanted to. And then we ended it fairly quickly because they were breaking things and changing all the settings. And so I'm talking to Brad. I'm like, okay, so who you know, we probably, we need to get somebody to help you because we, students are not going to keep putting stuff on our printers because they're breaking them. Mm-hmm. And um, I said, who do you want? And he says, well, I think Chase would be good. And I'm like, Chase? <laughs> and he says, yeah, he knows a lot about 3D printing. And it was just because you had been talking to Brad, but I had no idea that he knew about 3D printing. Mm-hmm. And then when Chase, so students can pick how they want to what concentration they want to do. And so when Chase was telling me he wants to do entrepreneurship, so first off, if you're engineering design, you already have to sell yourself, (laughs) right? Because people don't know what it is. You add entrepreneurship to it, people have no idea what that is. And so I'm like, are you sure, Chase? Because (laughs) you're going to have to really sell yourself. Mm -hmm. And Chase says, yes, I'm sure. And he's, he's, He's done it. He's here. So, <laughs> like, their first quarter, they have to make a pitch of their toy idea. So uh, then they have to make a presentation at the end of the quarter to uh, reach services, a formal presentation. And all throughout the studios, they're having to pitch their ideas. So they're talking. And we also combine um, humanities topics in studio. So in studio, you have to write about your design. You have to talk about your design. Uh, you have to present your design. So they, they do that a lot. But truthfully, if you had met him two weeks into his first quarter, you would have thought, wow, that's such a quiet. Yeah, just quiet guy, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And now you're leading the charge. The externs pulling pranks <laughs> on all of us. Excellent. Right. I see what Rose has done to you. <laughs> um, but no, that's again, it's, it's such an awesome program to hear about. I know Notre Dame's got a, a similar program they're working on that Ramon was in. So he, he did a dual major in mechanical engineering and industrial design, which focuses on that user focus that you guys have so heavily like capitalized on. And it really does make the perfect product engineers, right? We have to be just good enough in mechanical engineering to know how to make it that it won't break. And we have to be just creative enough to solve problems that no one else has solved because otherwise we wouldn't be building new products. Mm-hmm. So it's that weird Venn diagram of technical challenge and creative challenge that has to overlap. And if you're not excited about both it's not going to be a fun time but you guys have been really prepped for that oh absolutely yeah, yeah. no it's and again i think uh dr Brecken, you mentioned how you guys bring humanities in and writing is super important when you're doing what we do because the difference between you know screwing around in science is writing it down and for us it's all about documenting in a legible fashion why we did what we did when to a justify to our clients why it looks this way, why does it cost this much, how do we get here, justify it to any regulatory body, the FCC, the FDA, um, UL. This is how our design matches your design spec. This is the you know justification for your test. And if you can't write that way, it doesn't matter if it works perfectly. You have to get purchase into your ideas, both when you're selling our services as Glassboro, the company, selling our clients' ideas to their end clients, or doing it to a testing house just to get buy-in from partners in the industry. So I think that's a, a huge part that most engineering students overlook, right? They, they want to be good at math, good at simulation, the flashy things. But that writing part falls by the wayside, and it's super important when you want to work in the world that we live in, where half of all business communication is written, whether it's email, Slack, presentations, written reports, you name it, it's some form of writing. And they're all different forms. I think you and I were talking about this. Like, how many presentations do we go through at Glassboard every week? A lot. Like multiple ones a day is what most engineers are making in their field, right? Like I probably give at least one full PowerPoint I've built a day mm-hmm. because of the multiple clients I'm working with and the multiple programs that I have to sum up a week's worth of work in a 30 minute meeting in a PowerPoint effectively. So blending images and words and in that narrative quickly. So you're not having to build time or waste time perfecting some PowerPoint. It's all about being really efficient with your words. And on the flip side is grant writing. You have to take a fully written communication method that you're never going to meet the person reading your grant. You're never going to get to explain it to them and you're not allowed that many photos. So in words, how do you theater of the mind convince someone on the other side to have the government give you anywhere from a hundred thousand dollars to $3 million on 14 pages? Oh wow. Get ready, go. And that's called the SBIR route. It is literally 
14 pages of research strategy, win or lose. And that's such a different mode of writing that most engineers are used to. So we're working on that. We are. We're, we're getting more Elijah's, and more. Elijah's starting to volunteer as tribute and training with me and with grant yeah. writing. And Chase, you're, you've reviewed a lot of grants this year. You're, you're starting to clutch in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, that's been fun. Like yeah. just being able to see like the, the business side of getting the funding and, and seeing what it takes to actually like get, get your business off the ground in the real world. Like we learn about it in our, in our management classes I've been taking um, for my entrepreneurship concentration but i mean just seeing it is totally different yeah like the caliber of writing you have to do to win real world money versus get an a in a course is totally different absolutely i think uh one of the quotes i love that one of our other engineers from rose holman had this quote he goes man i thought i was really smart growing up you know got straight a's in high school was like near the top of my class and then i went to rose holman and i realized that i'm going to a really small school of only the smartest people in their course and i am the dumbest guy here by miles but I think I'm still smart, but I don't feel that way when I'm in college. And then I go to the real world and realize that the people that are truly at the top of their game are just next level, right? Like people that you can't relate to mm -hmm. from an ability or a skill or, or a specificity. But you got to find your value in what you do and blending your breadth with your mixed use, with your specialty and, and make that the value prop. And I think that finding your path in engineering is a very important lesson along those lines of, Oh, I think I'm really good at this. Oh man, I'm really not good at this, but I think I actually provide value, but maybe I don't sometimes. And it's that, you know, emotional back and forth of how do you grade is good, good enough. Right. And, and how do you guys at Rose handle that? That'd be one of the questions I, you know, ask, what are you doing with the students to prep them for that real world? So, um, for me, when I first went into industry first, it was horrible because I had to work all day. I was very much a spurt worker, like in school, I would work really hard and then I'd go goof off. And so having to learn to be productive was hard. And then also in school, I was on the quarter system. So every quarter you get your feedback, like, oh, you're getting great. You're doing great, but no, not in industry. So one of the things we do is we do a lot of competent, not yet competent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to, you have to do this to a, a level of being competent, and then we'll go on. And so I think, how is that for you? Is that frustrating or? It's definitely, it's something to get used to in the, in the beginning, like just receiving your first not yet competent from Dr. Bracken is not a, not a welcome sight. <laughs> I will say that just because, you, you know, I, I was the straight A student in high school. I had the 4.0, you know, and then I get to Rose and, <laughs> and my first couple of assignments, it's like, nope, you're, you're just not there yet. And then I, I would look at, at your feedback and be like, all right, so let me, let me fix it. And then you'd be like, nope, you're missing this one crucial part. And then that's when I would go and ask for help, which I'd never done before. Yep. <laughs> so that's, I, I like the system because it's not just like the one hard set, like, oh, you got a 70%, you suck, like go, go you know off. Purdue, that's the smartest guy in the room, right? They get right. the 70 out of hundred. <laughs> right. And the thing is, if there are things that you really want them to learn, you want them to do that part correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's one of my pet peeves and Chase knows this. In SolidWorks, I want the sketch to be fully defined. If it's not, down the road, it can cause lots of trouble. In the beginning, yes, you can make a drawing that looks perfect, but if that sketch isn't fully defined, later on, things It's will going to explode. Yes. No, thank you. All, what is, uh, what's the color in SolidWorks? Is it purple when it's undefined and white when it's defined? I forget the color scheme. I think scheme. it's blue. I think it's blue, yeah. Yeah, like no blue is, unde blue is undefined. Like no blue sketch dimensions. Yep. Everything's got to be either black or white, whatever SolidWorks' detail is. Like I think that's such a crucial thing to teach people. Because we at Glassbury harp on that all the time. Mm -hmm. I but just want you to stand in the corner with like a little megaphone saying, is it white? Is it black? No yeah. blue. No, no blue. blue. <laughs> That's right. That's because it's so important. And we teach the glass board is like the first thing we have to break people of. It's like, oh, I'm working fast. I'll fix that later. I'm like, no, we will fix that now because if we don't fix it now, it's only going to get fixed when that three Preach hours on, of work gets deleted. Reach on. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. That, that relates to our first project that we did. We had one student who was taking the first studio class as a mechanical engineer to kind of get ahead in his credits. And no matter what, he would not define his sketches all the way. And it was always like, just like he just couldn't get it to be defined. He would like define the, the needed dimensions, but it, something would be askew. Would be floating, yeah. Yeah, and then he kind of he kind of gave up halfway through the project, so I took over like what I what role I had assigned him. And so I went into his, to 
whatever part he was designing. And I was just clicking through it. And then I went to rebuild the model because I had like dumbed it down to just the sketches. My computer started smoking. Yeah, <laughs> he was go going to, to the moon. Yep, I had to go to EIT because my fans were spinning too much and something happened and my battery started smoking. It was bad. So, oh, yeah. you actually like burned down the computer. Oh, like legitimately, wow. oh, I had to go wow. get my computer fixed. Oh, wow. It's a graphic, no pun intended, actually full pun intended, uh, <laughs> explanation of how that happens. But no, and I think that the one thing we didn't learn at Purdue was modeling practice, right? We were talking about this early on in your internship, that there's an order of operation to 3D modeling. Like you want to do your base bodies, and then you want to do your subtractions, and then you want to do your edge changes, and then you want to do your end fillets. And I, I forget the exact order. We have it pasted on the board of the Emmy room. It hasn't fallen down before. If you build your model in this order that no one teaches you in school, but the pros use it, it won't explode. And yes, Take bring a that to I will. I, I will send you the hour-long presentation Autodesk does on it. It is <laughs> okay. phenomenal. It teaches you how to not blow up your models when they rebuild. Okay. Um, oh, I'd love yeah, that. You start with the base sketch. Sketches are more stable than solids. Solids are more stable than subtractions. Subtractions are more stable than what patterns or, or sweeps or lofts. Yeah. Uh, edge treatments are more stable than, I forget what the last one is that you do last. And then the last, last thing you do is design for manufacturing fillets is the last thing in your feature tree. And even if you're down here and you're adding fillets, like, oh, I need to go subtract this, you know, pocket out. You re rewind your feature tree all the way up and then do your subtractions oh, and then you okay. go all the way back down. Okay. And if you build them in this order, it will not explode. Well, it will explode less. I'll say that out loud. Yeah. Um, and then surface modeling because no one teaches that in college. Yeah. I, I, so I was talking to Dr. McCormack. That's, so when I went back, I was like, oh, I had this great visit at Glassboard. And here are the two things they said, sketching and surface modeling. So tell me... Tell me about surface modeling. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's another level. So we're trying to figure out what to do or how to do it. If you have So our, my, my answer is don't be afraid to throw them in the deep end because struggling with it early is so much easier than trying to struggle with it when you're already preconceived notion, I only think parametrically. It is breaking the habits. It's much harder than just teaching both at the same time. Now, yes, you have to have your basic parametric down before you can even contemplate what surfacing is. But teach it your junior year. Okay. Like, it is the power tool, and it'll enable your students to make shapes they couldn't have made parametrically. I'll, I'll have done that. I think it should be taught halfway through freshman year. There you go. <laughs> because if, if you can learn that fast for your base solids. Yeah. And so one of the things that you're talking about is, like, what doesn't work. Um, oh, do we need to be quiet? No. no, I just saw you look. I was like, oops, are we talking too much? No, no, no we, uh -huh. we, we, we're just about to wrap up, so we're good. Okay, so um, one of the things is like when to do Graphcom because students love doing solid works. You know, yeah. it's like they feel real when they're doing it. And so we, we don't want to start off with Graphcom because we're afraid they'd get stuck on that and we can't get them to go past it. So... Um, the first year we started on Graphcom, realized, okay, that's a mistake. We don't want to do that again. So then we started trying to integrate it little bits along the way. And that hasn't really worked that well in terms of just the Graphcom. So this year we're trying a new thing. We're going to do getting started first and do the hand sketching. And then we're going to do the uh, taking apart the corn popper, figuring out how it works. And then we're going to do two weeks of boot camp of just Graphcom. That's perfect. Yep. And you have to do it like all at once. Learning CAD is a thing best done in long sprints in front of a YouTube screen. Yep. Right? Like, don't do it in an hour here, an hour there. Don't, don't tiptoe them. The first learning curve is violent and steep, but it's better just to sprint up the hill. And here's the other idea we have, which I'm curious to see what you think about. So we have a lot of students that come in that already have a lot of SolidWorks experience. So what we're thinking of doing is putting it, putting one of those at each table mm -hmm. And um, have it be like no student left behind so that you haven't finished whatever the assignment is till everybody at your table has finished it. And so that the people who are really good stay and help the people who are struggling. I like that idea. I like that with one caveat. Okay, what's the one caveat? Most kids that come in with SolidWorks experience at 18 have a bunch of really terrible habits. Very true. Like... They take shortcuts, and it's perfect. It'll make their 3D-printed widget, no problem. But you're going to have the blind leading the blind here, and not just that it'll take it a long time for them to learn. You're probably going to be influencing a bunch of bad habits, like saving parts to your desktop and not in a project folder or a 
PDM or Vault, saving things um, in a way that the assemblies aren't linked to their base parts or base parts whose part number is part, right? And then mm -hmm. it's one of those oh, things yeah. that- Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, I, and I pick it up the high level ones, right? Those low level, like, you know, don't have undefined sketches, don't reference, you know, don't create circular references, don't go family trees of assemblies that have parts that reference children, that reference children, that reference the parents over here. That eventually makes a circle when you make the wrong constraint in the assembly. Even though the parts aren't connected, you'll end up referencing each other. And it's one of those things that you'll teach that if they're not taught in an order early on, just the first 30% has to be good. Once you're past that, yeah, let them all make okay. mistakes and learn. Okay, okay. It's, it's that first 30% is so critical when you're learning the how-tos that you eat your veggies the first time. Does that track? Because I think you and Asana and like the things you, you and I have worked through through like the automation workflows, the exact same right. thing. Right. Once you pick up the bad habits, like oh, I have to rip this whole thing up. No, we'll band-aid it. We'll fix it next time. Yeah, and it's uh, it's tough when they completely redesign the back end and workflow, and then you didn't go to the seminar when they taught you everything that changed. Yep. And then you got to eat your veggies and watch your boss fix it for you because he <laughs> understands it better than you too. No, it's because I didn't understand it. That's actually the point I make yeah. is that I didn't pick up the bad habits that like I didn't have the preconceived notion of one way or the other. Mm. Um, and it wasn't a bad habit when no, we did it no, the first time and then, yeah, it, became and then one. it became one when they completely yeah. changed uh, text fields. But it's that, that's the, the whole trick of the, the one fear is kids teaching other kids is needed, fantastic, wonderful. Have really good methods of checking core. What am I looking for, Chase? Like uh, orders of operations? Yeah. Right? Like there's a checklist of good CAD practices. Mm -hmm. Don't just check the end part dimensions. Check the CAD practices, right? Right. I think that's that's kind of what we do right now with like the when I went through it with the little different assignments that we had. I know you would always go in and check like, is it designed in the way that I wanted it to be? Not is does the part look correct? Right. Yeah, because we have so few kids that you're able to do that. That's so. amazing. I mean, I had like a thousand kids in my calc class at Purdue. Like it was like an auditorium, not like a lecture room. So we never had that amount of like personalized attention. So that's super neat to see. Um, but I think we're, we're wrapping up on time here. I mean, any, any final thoughts, Tamer, from, from your side, from our, our talent pipeline and kind of what we're looking for? I, I think it's been a really great summer so far. Uh, the energy level that these kids have brought to the office and they're all just hard workers. Uh, they're not afraid to present ideas now and they're not afraid to fight for their ideas. And I think that's been my favorite part is watching them gain confidence. And you know, our marketing intern today presented to the two founders and really held her own and i've seen chase do it as well and and watching them you know say i don't know how to do this can you help me and then turn around and say i have an idea and i'm gonna stick with it and i know it's the right idea has been just delightful no it's, it's super important to be able to you know fight for your ideas because someone might have an emotional initial gut reaction and you just haven't presented the right data that makes them see it through your lens, right? It's not that either opinion's wrong yet. Could be, one of them could be wrong, but it's how do I find the data to make that other person see it through the lens that they need to see it through, you know, to see the, what's underneath. I think that's something you guys as interns have really picked up over the summer. Because at the beginning it's like, is this right, black or white, yes or no? Like there's only one answer and there's like, no, there's a million shades of gray and which reason should I think this is right or wrong? And that's the better question to ask. Right. Yeah. We definitely have like branched out um, from our like black and white decision making, like you said. And like, I love your term of like knife fighting yeah. until one of us is like proven wrong. That's been my favorite like takeaway from the summer so far. No, and it's, it's so fun when you can take all of your ego and put that in the other corner and everyone takes their ideas and we all throw them into this corner, which watch them knife fight. And the idea wins. The logic wins at the end of the day. And no one's ego is involved in choosing which one we try first. It's not which one's right. It's always which one do we try first. Right. Because yeah. <laughs> the one in second place is still plan B. Yeah. So. And plan C. And plan C. <laughs> and, and then plan D is hanging out in the corner waiting, waiting to enter the fray when we run through the first yeah. two. Um, but that's, that's what's fun to watch you guys come in and grow your confidence over the summer. Because you all actually came in with the right base skill set, which was cool. Mm. Um, it's not often we'll get a whole cohort where everyone's got that underlying skill set. So none of us are teaching the, this is how to drive... CAD or SOLIDWORKS, or this is how you write a report, or this is what you do. It's more of like, 
this is where I'd grab that data from, go forth and destroy and like go, you know, whatever you want to do, you guys have got it. And it's so much fun to watch you guys help each other and also just mercilessly review each other. And that's also so important that you guys don't hold back. When one of you comes with a terrible idea, I watch them get smoked at the kitchen counter over coffee or, or water or pop or whatnot. And they go back to the computer and they rework the idea. And then it, then it, it's coming along. And that's so cool to see that you guys have already, because it was hard for me at my young age, like to separate my ego from my ideas and watching you guys just, Put that in the corner and then go knife fight the ideas out is so cool to watch. And and they will. They'll smoke each other over ideas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I get, you know, group group text photos in the evening where they're all hanging out. They all went to a movie together. They're, you know, they're baked really baked a cake. They're baked a cake. They're they <laughs> they're creating a they're creating a team which is not something that you can teach. And that's been really special to see them embrace the glass board culture of like, we work really hard and it is best idea wins. And it, there's a good chance it's not going to be your idea. And then at the end of the day, we still go out, mm -hmm. you know, for a drink or, you know, we can go out to lunch and, and have a good time and, and be there for each other. And I think that that to me has made the summer a success. Oh yeah. hundred percent. So now I, I always say, Chase, thank you for joining us over the summer and the fall and on the podcast. And Dr. Bracken, thank you for pioneering this program at Rose. I, I do think it's a different way of teaching engineering from, from, and this is from the commercial world, like you're producing the kind of engineers we want to see. And one thing to keep in mind is it's not just me. Like I have a team back at Rose and Chase will tell you there's a bunch of us that work together to make sure that we... Uh, administer the program and we even have a, an advisory board that I talk to a lot so I talk to them about how should I do testing how should I do stuff like that and it may be in your future to be on our advisory board sign me up about. keep me in the loop sign me up but thank you guys so much for coming on today and joining us absolutely thank you it for having fun. us yes awesome well, thanks everyone we'll catch you on the next one